This guy was my father's favorite fighter. You know, it's like, I grew up watching his fights. You know, it's honor to stay with him here. And you know, it's my pleasure, brother. My pleasure. He is the greatest MMA fighter of all time, in my opinion. The gap between George St. Pierre as a mixed martial artist and the rest of the world is too big for anybody else to close. That is the greatest fighter we've ever seen. If there's one man you can model your career on, the way he trains, the way he looks after his body, the way he cross trains, George St. Pierre would be that man. The best fighter to ever do it, and certainly without contest, the most professional. That's why one of the, one of the reasons why I always say you're one of the, the only athlete I ever met who taught me more than, than I taught you. Let's do something interesting real quick. How many fighters do you imagine have fought for the UFC over its entire history? Care to guess? Well, according to UFC.com, there have been about 3,000 fighters since the promotion began in 1993. Believe it or not, it's kind of hard to find the exact number on this, but, you know, this is what they give us at least. And how many of that total number have been champion? And so that number on their 30th anniversary amounts to 114 champions. We're excluding interim champions to be clear, and really the 114 total champs actually dwindles down to 97 when you account for duplicate champs considering a few of those title holders had multiple reigns. So if you break that down into your chances for actually becoming a champion joining UFC, it's really low at a mere 3.6%. Furthermore, it breaks down that of those 114 title reigns, literally almost half at 46 champions didn't even manage to get a single title defense. And in fact, 27 more of those 114 reigns only got a single defense. And the reason I bring this up is to illustrate just how rarefied the air that George St. Pierre shares with his welterweight record of nine title defenses. It's just one of the many reasons people consider him to be the greatest of all time. But what makes him truly stand out reaches far beyond his climb to the top of the sport in terms of accolades and accomplishments. It sounds a little too perfect though, doesn't it? Turns out there's a lot more to it than that. I'm Jason from MMA On Point, and this is MMA Legends, George St. Pierre. GSP was born to Roland and Pauline St. Pierre in a small French-speaking town of only about 2,000 people called St. Isidore in Quebec, Canada. He was actually born two weeks late, and in his book, his mother notated that he was born with legions on his face and scabs all over his body as a result of this. He even described himself as, quote, just another reject and developed strange habits like constantly licking himself and chewing on the collar of his shirt. At age eight, he had a kidney operation, leaving a scar on his back that persists to this day, and also dealt with psoriasis for a time growing up. And so as these things unfortunately go, George was relentlessly bullied. Instead of focusing on what the teacher was explaining, I was focusing on, on how I'm going to get out of the class, of the class, take my, my, my books and reach the bus before the bullies get me in and hit me. But because I was victim when I was young, I think it left a scar. But sometimes it's for the, the best and sometimes it's for the worst. Seen as an easy target, which followed him everywhere from the schoolyard to the gym and in front of his friends. There's a fantastic documentary shot on Fight Pass that details the time GSP finally stood up to his bullies and he hit back after his friend was spit on one day at school. I believe people are bullied because of the image that they, they projected. If you look down, raise your shoulder, and look like a weakling. And like in nature, the lion will always go for the animal who's weak. The people will bully the easy target. At age seven, George was formally introduced into the martial arts for the first time with Kyokushin Karate by his father. Initially, it was just him and his dad who had prior training, and when they felt George was ready, he enrolled him into a local dojo. Within about five years of training, he moved from white belt to black belt at age 13. In the next few years, St. Pierre became far more interested in finally putting an end to bullying and getting back at his assailants when one day he broke a bully's arm after being teased in class. GSP recalls that as the day the bullying finally stopped, and to his surprise, 
he actually started becoming popular. In his own words, he described it as bullshit and was actually more angry that people started to respect him all of a sudden just because he beat somebody up. Although he was finally becoming accepted, he actually felt a little more distant. It was during this time that he decided to focus more heavily on becoming a great martial artist and started attending local MMA events in Quebec at the age of 16. Here he would first see his idol and future mentor Christophe the French Hurricane Midou compete. Introducing Christophe Midou! Although Midou doesn't have the best record of 6-10, he did manage to put on some memorable fights with Jeremy Horn and Fabrizio Verdum. He did unfortunately lose, but his legacy as a man coming from the same background as GSP and Kyokushin Karate was cemented by bringing in one of the greatest athletes the sport has ever seen. And one of the more batshit crazy moments in his life, George described in his book that he spotted Kristoff walking down the road and actually stopped his car while blocking traffic and everything to literally just chase after Kristoff and ask him to train with him, which he actually accepted. So it was in Montreal that the two began training together. It was here that Midou proclaimed George would be a world champion. In GSP's autobiography, he detailed that he debuted at the age of 16 in the amateur ranks. The youngest video I can find is from just a couple months before his 19th birthday. And ironically, the video was filmed and uploaded by the man Heatface in his pro debut two years later, Ivan Menjivar. And it wouldn't last very long either. Despite the close fist strikes being banned, GSP would slap fight his way to a quick TKO stoppage in only about three minutes here. By the time of the Ivan Menjivar fight, he was 21 and he had entered into their ring with Kristoff in his corner. The fight itself was short and did show some of the promise that GSP would later fulfill. <laughs> But it ended controversially when George pointed at Ivan Menjivar thinking he had verbally submitted. Uh, well, the ref listened to him and stopped the fight. George but it was an honest mistake and one that GSP has detailed numerous times that he doesn't actually count as a win himself. Even still, it was a fun fight while it lasted, and this was the early home George would take for competition. His next three fights were anything but controversial as well as he finished each man with one submission and two TKOs, capturing the UCC welterweight title in the process. And so this was when George would face his big first test. Back when the UFC was first bought by Zufa, the company was struggling really badly and lost about $45 million until the Ultimate Fighter finally saved them a couple years later. But back in 2003, the UFC was struggling pretty bad. This meant many fighters weren't being signed to exclusive contracts at the time, and the UFC didn't have the buying power to hold their fighters like they do today. So Pete Spratt, a man who was just coming off a big win against future welterweight champion Robbie Lawler, decided to take his talents up to Canada to take on then a massive underdog in George St. Pierre. Presumably it was just going to be an easy payday and another one for the win column against a no-name opponent, but GSP was already an incredible talent who was more than game to the occasion. Lightning fast by Scrap, good takedown by St. Pierre. So he's trying to open up some knee strikes, but oh, he goes for a top mount. That was beautiful. He's going to be a lot of trouble do. if he can't get St. Pierre off his back. The oh, choke he's taking his choke. This okay. one could be oh, off. Oh, and it's up. over. Huge win for St. Pierre. What's actually a really interesting parallel here is just one week prior, George's then athletic idol Matt Hughes had sunk in the exact same spectacular and iconic submission with a standard rear naked on Frank Trigg at UFC 45. Not to mention it foreshadowed one of the greatest rivalries in MMA history. And so after something crazy like that, GSP was just impossible to ignore. He already had a sizable following in Canada with how impressive his wins were already at that point, and he was brought over to the UFC just a mere two months later after the Pete Spratt win. 
win. There were reports of Pride looking at him as well, but since they didn't have a true 170 pound class, being on the other side of the planet, the American promotion simply just made more sense. But the UFC certainly wasn't about to give GSP some free favors here. Immediately throwing him in against one of the most dangerous and underrated welterweights truly of all time, Carl Parisian. Carl was already a 12 fight veteran with his only loss coming to a repeat title challenger at 150 and 170. He would eventually actually become the champion at 155 later on too, Sean Shirk. There is zero shame in a loss like that. Carl would go on to beat names like Shoney Carter, Nick Diaz, Chris Lytle, and Matt Serra. Just an incredibly dangerous submission talent. So GSP wasn't exactly being given the welcome wagon in his UFC debut. And that danger is exactly how the fight bore out. GSP admitted in his book that he probably should have lost this fight in multiple submission attempts that he somehow squirmed his way out of. The difference was his top control and ability to keep Carl on the defensive for the vast majority of the fight. It was a testament to GSP's talent and it immediately got everyone's attention. Only six fights into his career, he had very real title fight potential and a well-rounded game truly not seen outside of Matt Hughes at this point in the UFC's welterweight division. So after an impressive first round TKO of Jay Huron in the first round at UFC 48, Zufa decided they were going to cash in. The newly minted George St. Pierre was a star and had the ability, so only after two fights in the UFC and seven fights to his name total, he would get his first title shot, making it one of the earliest of the modern era against Matt Hughes at UFC 50 in October of 2004. It would indeed prove to be too much for George though. GSP has candidly talked about his mistakes in that fight since then and the mental hurdle of fighting his then idol. This loss is the best thing happened in my career. I gained so much, so much belief in myself, you know, so much confidence. And now I'm twice stronger than I was uh, when I fought him. And I'm, I'm twice uh, more confident than I was, you know, and I got a lot, a lot more tools, you know. I will be the next. Uh, welterweight champion, no doubt. Hughes' accomplishments at that time were just unrivaled by literally anyone else in MMA. He was by far the most dominant champion and people like Fedor were in their infancy as champions. And Anderson wouldn't even become a UFC middleweight champion until 2006. This predated all of that. So it was a bitter loss for young George, but as time would prove, it was just delaying the inevitable. Immediately after this, GSP went on a huge tear, being a who's who in the division that included a quick fight back in Canada for the TKO promotion against David Strasser. I've come all the way from America up to Canada to fight George St. Pierre. I don't do much talking. I let my fist do the talking. And a young Jason Mayhem Miller actually, Frank Trigg and Sean Shirk setting him up for the number one contenders match against the man to finally dethrone Matt Hughes a few years earlier. BJ Penn. And he was coming off a stint in K1 after the Hughes win where Penn just went all out in terms of weight class and competition fighting Dwayne Ludwig, Henzo Gracie, Rodrigo Gracie, and even a 220 plus pound Lyoto Machida. Before this, BJ Penn earned his nickname as the prodigy for his incredibly quick rise in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, being the first American to win a BJJ World Championship at Mundials. <laughs> de nove minutos, acaba a luta, vitória do BJ Penn, ficando com o título mundial. So going into that fight, the conventional wisdom for George was simple. Whatever you do, do not take BJ Penn down. That's when a world-renowned but then lesser-known MMA coach advised just the opposite. In George's book, he details how John Danaher was essentially being laughed out of the room by everyone in the MMA world when he calmly suggested that George should take BJ Penn down. The belief was Penn had no bottom game submissions on his record in MMA at that point in time. GSP listens, but wasn't quite sold on it. Fast forward to the end of the first round of their first fight, GSP was battered. His eyes and nose were bleeding, and probably for the only time in his career, you saw a dejected looking GSP 
SCP seriously baffled about what to do next. That was when Danaher again brought up this insanely crazy idea of going for the takedown. And sure enough, that's exactly what won him the fight by a razor close margin. So here he was again, right back where he was two years prior against Matt Hughes, the only man to beat him to date. There ended up being a short detour of that rematch when GSP withdrew from their bout with a groin injury. BJ Penn stepped in, but Hughes was able to assert himself as the winner and was literally declared the greatest ever by Dana White after that fight. So GSP's time off made their rematch even bigger with Hughes avenging his last loss, making him easily the most dominant UFC champion they'd ever seen at that time. But in fact, this time it was GSP's time to shine, finally coming back to beat Matt Hughes. With this win behind him and his incredible dream of becoming champion fully realized, GSP would then go on to his incredibly memorable title streak that we all remember him for today. Um, yeah, not so fast. In his very first title defense on April 7th, 2007 against Matt Serra, a strong competitor, but let's be honest, he was a massive underdog who just won the comeback season The Ultimate Fighter. We all know this story. He handed GSP what is the opinion of many, including myself, to be the biggest underdog victory in the history of MMA. would later detail in his book that he took Matt Serra too lightly and after being knocked down allowed his pride to get in the way of the fight. The biggest thing he says is that he didn't accept the knockdown instead of admitting in the moment that he was actually hurt. This was a lesson that would prove to be critical in his career moving forward. It took me a while after that fight to, to let this thing go away. I was carrying a lot of bricks and this brick, the name of that brick was Matt Serra. I threw that, I, I took that brick and I threw it in the river. And I can promise my friend that in every single of my next fight, they will see the best George Napier, the, the most well-prepared George Napier I can be. So four months later, GSP was back on the title trail, this time against NCAA Division I wrestling champion Josh Koscheck, who only had one MMA loss in 10 fights at this point. You wouldn't know he had the superior wrestling background though, as St. Pierre again dominated another ground game technician with his own wrestling despite having no credentials in the craft. I mean, we've really never seen anything like this before since, with a win over a top prospect like this, GSP was already poised back for another title shot. But that title opportunity came knocking much sooner when Matt Serra injured himself ahead of his first title defense, which was supposed to be against Matt Hughes. So GSP stepped in on short notice for a trilogy fight against Hughes, and it was a moment that GSP would quickly seize as he dominated him, winning by an armbar mirroring his loss to Hughes in their first fight to cement himself as the winner of their rivalry and status as interim champion at the time. And so by this point, the UFC had never been to Canada, which is kind of hard to believe in the 2000s, but they rightly recognized George's star power. The stage was set for a now massive rematch against Matt Serra to unify GSP's interim title with Serra's undisputed title. And it was going to happen not just anywhere in Canada, but Montreal, not far from where GSP grew up. Not to mention this is where he began his MMA career. And as one would have predicted, they broke the UFC's then record for the fastest ticket sales in UFC history and also set the UFC all-time attendance record with 21,390 fans at the Bell Center. So with the weight of an entire country on his back and an unbelievable amount of pressure to avenge his loss with Matt Serra, George did just that. And it wasn't even close. GSP absolutely dominated every second of that fight and ended up finishing his foe with devastating knees on the ground very few could ever hope to withstand. And this time, the dream was truly realized. GSP would never lose his title again. He dominated John Fitch, who would otherwise go undefeated for seven years outside of GSP, completely dominated BJ Penn in one of the few real super fights in MMA history when Penn was still the incredible 150 
25 pound champ coming up to face him again. Tiago Alves was a machine, possibly handing Matt Hughes his worst defeat at that time. The knockout artist Dan Hardy, and then Josh Koscheck again after a memorable season coaching the Ultimate Fighter. His next fight would earn him the honor of breaking the North American and UFC attendance record yet again, smashing the previous record with over 55,000 fans packed into the Rogers Center when he beat Strike Force former middleweight champion Jake Shields. It was at this time that his next opponent was announced, another Strike Force champion who was coming over shortly after the UFC purchased the promotion, Nick Diaz. Being one of the most popular MMA stars of all time, who is truly opposite of GSP in many ways, the hype was beyond massive. But that would end up being shelved for a couple reasons. Number one, Diaz no showed their press conference straight up to promote the event in an act of defiance that got him booted down the card, switching GSP's opponent to Carlos Condit. Double. Fuck you. But two, George faced a serious injury forcing him off the card when he tore his ACL in training. I've made a few references to St. Pierre's book already, but at this time, this singular moment is what he recognized as his biggest struggle. ACL tears used to be a death sentence. Any man's career in sports was essentially over, and this was even true for some in GSP's welterweight era. Even just a one-year timeline of recovery was considered ambitious. And so this moment in time was so big for him that it was the catalyst for his book to be written in the first place. He considered his biggest challenge in life and discussed the fear that he had to face of his career being over for good. Meanwhile, the war in the welterweight division was still being waged while he was out. Nick Diaz earned another win over BJ Penn that led to one of the most memorable callouts in MMA history. Are you out, George? But GSP just wouldn't be ready for some time to compete again, so an interim bout was matched between Diaz and Carlos Condit, as Condit edged the decision to win the interim title. But GSP was making real progress as 2012 continued, and he was finally able to make his return on November 17th, 2012, against Carlos Condit to unify their titles, the second time George was in this position of unifying belts. Although George controlled most of the action, there was a flashback moment when Condit landed a huge head kick that rocks GSP. SP. This brought him back to the Sarah fight years ago, but St. Pierre detailed in his book that he learned from the past, and this time, he would not rush to stand back up immediately. Instead, he swallowed his pride and defended. Because of this decision, he was able to survive and continue to earn the decision victory. It's what he cited in his book, as well as his retirement speech, as his proudest moment of growth and maturity to handle being hurt and somehow still come out on top. Let me, let me tell you something, uneducated fool. Motherfucker, I'm not stupid. I can tell what's what. Yeah, you, you look pretty smart I'm right listening. now. No, I'm listening. To be honest with you, I think a lot, a lot of times, you know, making me out to be, uh, to be the evil villain, I fit the description as the evil villain. You know, they're, they're selling you all wolf tickets, people. You're eating them right up. George here is selling wolf tickets. It would seem the worst was already over at this point, but there was still a gigantic fight with Nick Diaz looming. And outside of UFC 100, which was a card also shared by several other massive stars of his era, the numbers would starkly bear out the success of this event, selling nearly 1 million pay-per-view buys, the most he'd ever sold as a headliner by himself. And aside from some bright spots throughout the fight on the feet from Diaz, it was pretty much all GSP as he controlled Diaz on the ground and even held his own on the feet with his jab to control some of the exchanges. I, I, I want a rematch. I think I can beat you. That's what I think. I may be a better matchup for uh, Anderson Silva as well. The next fight would easily be his toughest defense ever. Amid the buildup to UFC 167, George began ramping up his talk of the need for more stringent testing in the UFC as the fight drew closer. I wanted to show everyone that it's possible to be champion and, and uh, without losing drug and I want to make a statement, raise the bar. It's, it's like all mind games. Oh, you're on steroids. Oh, you're on this. Or, oh, I, I might be retiring. Oh, this. Rumblings of a possible retirement began to grow behind the scenes. This was something he denied in the pre-fight interviews leading up to it, and what went down that night ended up being incredibly notorious itself for many reasons. Essentially, GSP won the decision. I know this is a legends piece, and I want to be as positive as I can, but I do have to bear out the facts here. MMADecisions.com cataloged the scores of all the major MMA media outlets, and every single one of them, from MMA Fighting, SureDog, Bloody Elba, Fightmetric, and even Sportsnet in Canada, all scored the fight 47, 
48, meaning Johnny Hendricks would be the new champion. Fans and fighters also echoed their sentiments. Many called the fight a robbery, and to make matters worse, Dana White did not hold back at all for his thoughts on what happens. Does anybody here think Johnny Hendricks didn't want to fight? It's about damage. This is a fight. I'm blown away that George St. Pierre won that fight. And listen, I'm a promoter. I think the Nevada State Athletic Commission is atrocious. I think the governor needs to step in immediately before these guys destroy the sport like they did boxing. I'd just recommend that anybody who has an opinion about this rewatch the fight and come to your own conclusion. On top of all this, there was a ton of tension between Dana White and George at the press conference. For some reason, Dana told the press that GSP was at the hospital, only to be contradicted moments later. I saw George the went straight to the hospital and Johnny's doing an interview. He'll be here in two minutes. Okay. I gave George St. Pierre the third round. Just one round. People can say whatever they want is up to the judges, uh, but I, I, I give my best. He and I will leave here and we will go talk. It was under these circumstances and on this night that he announced his hiatus from MMA, stopping just shy of proclaiming his retirement. And for the next few years, that was the last we'd see of the welterweight kingpin inside of a cage. GSP, you've always said you wouldn't fight him. Uh, if he came back and somehow got the belt, uh, would you move straight to middleweight? Uh, from what I, I've, we've talked about, he's not he's not coming back for the belt. He's coming back for the odd fight, I think, that interests him. If, if he comes back. And because he never fully retired with the talk of a return when he did step away, there were constant rumors of him coming back. All the way until 2016, when GSP officially announced that he was ready to return back to the sport. <laughs> Exactly, that's what I'm wow. saying, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. There's a shot, there's another uh, go, another run. I better do it and do it quick because it's time to do it now. And you would think it would be as simple as this, right? He wants to come back. The UFC is a star-driven sport. In what turned out to be a record year for them in 2016, GSP would fit into that very nicely. But that's when things just got strange. George St. Pierre will not fight again. I've been in this since I was 19 years old. I know the mentality of a fighter that wants to fight, and I know the mentality of a fighter that does not want to fight. I, I wholeheartedly believe you will never see George St. Pierre in the octagon again unless he's cornering somebody. I'm telling you again, I don't think GSP wants to fight. I, I just think he lost that fire a long time ago. And whether it was a strong arm tactic to get GSP to lower his fight purse or some strange dislike is anybody's guess. But this carried on for almost a year. He doesn't know anything about me. They let me fight once and you'll see in the first minute of the fight that what you just said is, uh, is wrong. GSP at one point even announced himself as a free agent and joined a short-lived fighters union while this was all going on. That's when in March 2017, his next fight was announced. George St. Pierre's back. So everything I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the biggest fight as possible. And I wanna make no one gives story. a fuck. No one gives a fuck, George. Everybody, I'm sorry I'm late. Dana, my apologies, George, my apologies. But there was another problem. Despite having a press conference and a war words to promote their matchup. I think you should shut, shut up. You're embarrassing yourself right now. Are, are you still drunk right now? Are you still drunk? Or what, what's no. going on? There was strangely no date announced for their fight. It was reportedly targeted for International Fight Week, which is traditionally in the summer. That event would have been UFC 213, but GSP had repeatedly stated that he would not be ready for that time. This prompted Dana White to call the fight off and say the winner of Yoel Romero versus Robert Whitaker would now fight for an interim title, taking place ironically at UFC 213, and the winner of that would face Bisbing for a title unification bout later on in the year. And despite Whitaker winning and Bisbing being meeting him in the cage that night. This too ended up falling through as Whitaker injured himself, once again putting GSP back in line for a title shot. And so after two and a half years of a hiatus and rampant speculation, George St. Pierre was finally booked to fight against Michael Bisping for the middleweight title at UFC 217 in New York City at Madison Square Garden. And just like that, the promotion picked up right where it left off. Another strange scenario began to brew though. During this time, photos and videos began 
began to emerge of GSP in his training camp preparing for Bisbing, which created quite a bit of chatter about the way GSP was looking in his preparation. We would later find out that he was battling a condition called ulcerative colitis that drastically affected his camp and nearly resulted in the fight being called off entirely. But before the public knew about this, rumors swirled that he was out of shape. No one knew GSP was fighting tooth and nail with his sickness in this camp. So despite the massive hurdles, GSP overcame everything and looked to be in superb shape at the weigh-ins and on fight night. As Bisbing and St. Pierre walked out that night, it felt like a real moment, a real main event. Finally, GSP was indeed back, and the fight itself was even better than the hype could have ever predicted. his first finish since BJ Penn at UFC 94 nearly 10 years before it, it appeared that he was an even better athlete than who had left a couple years prior. As the dust settled, much would be revealed about GSP's condition leading up to that fight and the fact that it was directly due to his weight gain to make middleweight. And in just over a month, George decided to relinquish his newly earned belt. While he expressed a desire to continue fighting, the door was again partially closed in a similar fashion to what he'd said after the Hendricks fight. But surely he'd be returning for more than just one fight, right? Well, it turns out the issues with President Dana White were pretty far from over. As time went on, there wasn't much talk on George's end, but there was of one fight at lightweight a weight that he stated he was fully capable of making surprisingly. He didn't express much interest in fighting at middleweight or even welterweight, but rather against two men, Conor McGregor or Habib Nurmagomedov. And especially after the dominant performance Habib put on Conor at UFC 229, this is when GSP really set his sights directly onto Habib. But those negotiations fell through with GSP essentially openly saying that he wanted to fight for the title at 155. Dana White actually blocked this move. George St. Pierre and I had a deal. He was going to fight Bisping at, the, at 185 pounds, and if he won, he would defend the title. He bailed on that. So you can't just come out and, and handpick fights that you want for titles. But what if it was 165? Is, is that something you'd be more apt to do? I'm about to start beating my head off the concrete right now in about two seconds. So on February 1st, 2019, GSP announced at a press conference in Montreal that his MMA career was in fact over and that he was retired. There's no tears. I'm very happy to do it. And I always said that I, I want to retire on my own and not be told to retire. So uh, in combat sport and full contact sport, that's how you should retire, you should retire on top. In some ways, this was almost more distressing and exciting than any other exit from the sport in previous years. It's so rare to even think of a fighter retiring after a title win. Almost no one retires on top. But for now, that leaves me with some final thoughts. If he truly has walked away for good, forever. He'll do it with perhaps the greatest legacy in MMA history. Regardless of anyone one might consider to be the greatest of all time, George St. Pierre retired on his own terms, with the best record and longevity possible. He's avenged the only two losses he's ever had, won titles in two weight classes, with a streak that is unlikely to ever be broken, and if it is, possibly not within our lifetime. He was a massive pay-per-view draw, represented an entire country, and the thing that I really feel needs to be said is that in the wild world of MMA, with huge scandals, controversies left and right, George went through all of that unscathed. There's not a shred of misconduct or controversy that follows him as he rides off into the sunset. The man accomplished astronomical feats in the sport, full of shady characters and trappings of money and fame, without finding himself in the middle of any of that. I truly question if we will ever see this again. I certainly hope we can, and that GSP models the way forward for athletes to go out with their health and streaks intact. And Habib has certainly credited him as a role model in the past. So just as much as I wish he returned, indeed many of you probably do, there's part of me that hopes he never does.